Everyone, welcome to the Alan P. Kirby Jr. Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship, where we are the outpost for Hillsdale College here in our nation's capital. As many of you know, we host uh, numerous educational programs in the liberal arts tradition and on the first principles of our country. Uh, so as is our tradition, we are going to have one of our students introduce our special guest for this evening. Reagan Cool is a junior studying political philosophy and religion and is originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan. This semester, she's interning at the American Principles Project while studying on the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program here in DC. Reagan. Good evening. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Heather McDonald. Heather McDonald is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in English from Yale University, a Master of Arts in English at Cambridge University, and a Juris Doctor degree from Stanford Law School. She writes for several newspapers and periodicals, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Public Interest. She's also the author of several books, including The War on Cops and The Burden of Bad Ideas. Tonight, she will discuss her latest publication, The Diversity Delusion, How Race and Gender Pandering Corrupt the University and Undermine Our Culture. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Ms. Heather McDonald. Thank you so much. I mean, I've been on the road from New York. Let me get my little secret water glass here before I start. I don't want to have a cough attack. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reagan. And thank you for Hillsdale. This is back to, to normalcy. I've been, I've been speaking a lot on college campuses recently. <laughs> you know what that means. I've received the walkout, the storm the stage strategy, and at Claremont McKenna College in California, the blockade, which prevented anyone from actually entering to hear my talk. So-called students of color at nearby Pomona College announced that I was a, quote, fascist, white supremacist, war hawk, transphobe, queerphobe, classist, and ignorant of interlocking systems of domination that produce the lethal conditions under which oppressed peoples are forced to live, end quote. So to actually have an audience still in its seats and apparently willing to listen is an unusual experience outside of a Hillsdale crowd that may take me a few minutes to adjust to. Now, we've been hearing a lot of late about the crisis of free speech on college campuses, but not much about its root cause. The narcissistic victimology that is rapidly spreading from academia to the rest of our culture. In a word, the American University, and again, all of this applies to everything other than Hillsdale, fortunately, so we can at least remember there's some sanity left. But in general, the American University is in the grips of a mass hysteria. Students actually believe that they are victims of oppression at risk of their lives from circumambient racism and sexism. The degree of maudlin caterwauling is impossible to overstate. At Brown, students of color occupied the president's office and complained about having to meet such academic expectations as going to the class when they were so focused on, quote, staying alive at Brown. At Yale, a mob of minority students surrounded a highly respected sociologist and cursed and screamed at him for three hours because his wife had sent an email suggesting that students can choose their own Halloween costumes free from the ministrations of Yale's diversity bureaucrats. Among the shouts of, shut the F up, and you are disgusting, that were directed at this mild-mannered left-wing professor was a cry of, we're dying, from one of the ranters referring to the allegedly endangered status of Yale's minority students. But my favorite moment in this parade of narcissism comes from Princeton. In 2015, Princeton's black students chanted, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
Now, this was a phrase first used by Fannie Lou Hammer, a civil rights activist who was beaten in the 1950s for trying to vote. Fannie Lou Hammer had grounds aplenty for being sick and tired of being sick and tired. But any Princeton student, I don't care if he's purple, orange, or blue, who thinks of himself as oppressed is in the grip of a terrible delusion that will encumber him for the rest of his life. Well, perhaps you're thinking, at least the adults on campus are trying to give these students a firmer grip of reality. To the contrary, the adults actively encourage this hysteria. A massive diversity bureaucracy is devoted to cultivating in students ever more arcane species of self-involvement and ever more preposterous forms of self-pity. You want to know the reason for astronomical tuition? Look no further than this bureaucratic bloat. Students regularly act out little psychodramas of oppression before an appreciative audience of diversity deanlets and vice provosts of equity and inclusion who use the occasion to expand their dominion. Many campuses have created bias response teams modeled presumably on active shooter response teams on the assumption that discrimination is so rampant and lethal on campus that a rapid defense force is needed. Freshman orientations and dorm sessions invariably feature seminars on toxic masculinity and white privilege. Students are taught that they are either the oppressed or the oppressors. If you are not female, black, Hispanic, gay, or any one of the 116 and still metastasizing categories of gender, the only way that you can escape being an oppressor is by becoming a, quote, ally. Allies are something usually associated with war. And indeed, the reigning thinking is that female students and students of color are literally in a war zone on college campuses and need allies from the opposing side to survive. Am I exaggerating? I am not. UC Berkeley's Division of Equity and Inclusion hung banners throughout campus reminding students of the University of California's paramount mission, assigning guilt and innocence in the ruthlessly competitive totem pole of victimhood. One banner, banner featured a female black student and a male Hispanic student allegedly pleading, allow people other than yourself to exist, a message directed to Berkeley's white students and faculty. This is not hyperbole. They meant it literally. College presidents are the worst offenders in encouraging this delusional victimology. After the three-hour expletive field tirade against the Yale sociologist, Yale's president, Peter Salovey, actually thanked the boorish thugs for making him proud of his student body. Yale subsequently conferred a racial justice prize on two of the most aggressive participants. The dean of the Harvard Medical School recently removed the portraits of its greatest physician scientists from the entrance hall to the school. You can guess the reason. They were all male. And thus looking on them would make Harvard's wilting medical students feel uncomfortable and unsafe. We can only wish these budding doctors luck in the operating room. Narcissistic identity politics has destroyed the serious pursuit of knowledge throughout the humanities and most of the social sciences. Students are being given a license for ignorance. All they need be told about a book is the melanin content and gonads of its author to know whether they can dismiss its contents as thoroughly repugnant and not worth reading. Shakespeare, Milton, Plato, Kant, and Locke have been variously defenestrated by students who have not the slightest clue about Periclean Athens, the Renaissance, or the Enlightenment. A Columbia undergraduate groused about Columbia's beleaguered core curriculum, quote, who is this Mozart, this Haydn, these superior white men? The core, she said, upholds the premises of white supremacy and racism. No professor has ever defended our intellectual patrimony against such shameful outbreaks 
of ecstatic know-nothingism without appending some puling qualification about respect for diversity. Academic identity politics are now rapidly spreading throughout the culture at large. Every non-academic institution, no matter how previously meritocratic, is now vulnerable, and that means above all the STEM fields. Exhibit A into our culture's descent into identity-driven mediocrity and thought control is the firing of computer engineer James Damore from Google in August 2017. Damore had written a carefully reasoned fact-based memo suggesting that the average career preferences of males and females may explain why there's not 50-50 gender parity at Google and other tech firms. The language that Google's CEO used in firing Mr. Damore was a direct import from academic victimology. Google's employees were, quote, hurting, he said because Damore had dared to challenge the reigning feminist orthodoxy. What followed Mr. Damore's firing was even scarier. A regional branch of the National Labor Relations Board upheld Google's actions on the same bathos-drenched victim grounds. Mr. Damore's memo had made Google's employees feel, quote, unsafe at work, according to the NLRB Associate General Counsel. The memo thus constituted, quote, discrimination and sexual harassment. Consider for a moment what this NLRB ruling means for science. Any evolutionary biologist, psychologist, or econ economist who studies the different risk preferences and appetite for competition among males and females is now at risk of his job. These branches of, shut of science could shut down completely no matter that their findings are true. The thinking that got Mr. Damore fired is now the dominant characteristic of our time. It holds that the absence of exact proportional representation of various racial, ethnic, and sexual groups in any institution is by definition a result of discrimination. To suggest that different groups have different capacities, cultures, skills, and behaviors that explain the lack of proportional representation is not just taboo, it can get you fired. And so the mad rage for race and gender proportionality in the workplace is accelerating, especially in the Me Too moment. From here on out, everything you read, everything you watch in the mainstream media will have been calculated in conformity with the demands of diversity. If you are a white male, no matter how talented, you're going to have to meet a higher standard to get hired or promoted. This summer, California Polytechnic Insti University proudly announced that its crusade to lower the number of whites on campus was succeeding. Every college is in essence doing the same thing, if not as publicly. Newsrooms are under enormous pressure to find reporters, select sources, and originate stories that improve their diversity profile. Book publishers are obsessively engineering their list to prioritize, quote, diverse authors and themes. Thanks to media pressure and their own human resources departments, corporate boardrooms have made a fetish of gender proportionality. Even before California mandated female board hires, I routinely voted against every female who shows up on a proxy ballot, since I assume that she is there because of her sex and not her business experience. A case in point, Drew Kilburn Faust, the outgoing president of Harvard, recently accepted a position on the board of Goldman Sachs. Now, who knew that left-wing history professors were experts in investment banking? University administrators and faculty may hate capitalism, but they love capitalist dollars. Even classical music is being poisoned by identity politics. New Yorker music critic Alex Ross triggered outrage against the Chicago and Philadelphia symphony orchestras this spring by tweeting that they had programmed no female composers in their upcoming seasons. Never mind that at that very moment, 
The Chicago Symphony was at Carnegie Hall performing Jennifer Higdon's Concerto for Low Brass, a work commissioned by the Chicago and Philadelphia orchestras at no doubt greatly inflated cost. It is absurd to expect gender parity in the concert hall. The reality is this. The greatest composers of all time, whether Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Chopin, or Brahms, were male. Get over it. <laughs> and simply be grateful for the beauty that they gave us unworthy mortals. But classical music boards are also under enormous pressure to hire by gender and race for conducting positions and everything else. A classical music, music agent told me wistfully, quote, if only I had a trans conductor, I'd be rich. Now, it is an unalloyed pleasure that Hollywood is being forced to sacrifice its best box office judgment to meet the demands of the race and gender bean counters. But it is in the sciences where the diversity imperative becomes actually dangerous. Every academic science department, whether physics, mathematics, or chemistry, is in the victimologist's crosshairs. The federal government is demanding that scientific departments hire based on gender and race rather than scientific merit. Science education is being slowed down and watered down in the hope of graduating more females and underrepresented minorities. An oncologist in an Ivy, at an Ivy League medical school was berated by his dean for an exam in pharmacology that was, quote, too fact-based. Well, I don't know about you, but if I have cancer, I want my doctor to know the facts about drug interactions. The National Science Foundation is spending billions of your taxpayer dollars on programs to boost diversity in science arguing that only a diverse laboratory can achieve scientific breakthroughs. Well, that's funny because somehow the 200 National Science Foundation grantees who won Nobel Prizes managed to discover dark matter and the genetics of viruses, among other breakthroughs, without conforming to today's diversity metrics. And of course, this mania for gender and race parity in science continues into the private sector. After James Damore was fired, a human resources manager sued YouTube and Google for firing him because he had refused to go along with the mandate to interview only females and underrepresented minorities for incoming engineering jobs. Potentially groundbreaking scientists are being passed over today because they are of the wrong race and gender. Guess who does not care about diversity? China. The best thing that Trump could do to level the playing field would be to airlift a few cargo planes of gender theorists from American universities and dump them on Beijing University and China's research labs. Until that happens, China will inexorably pull out ahead of us since in science, it cares only about one thing, scientific achievement. Academic identity politics is tearing our society apart. It is teaching young people to hate, to hate the greatest thinkers and creators of the past, and to hate their fellow Americans. The diversity delusion, therefore, has to be nipped in the bud. The next time self-engrossed students occupy a campus building demanding reparations, here is what their college president should say. Are you kidding me? You're the most privileged individuals in human history. You have at your fingertips the thing that Faust sold his soul for, knowledge. You're surrounded by libraries that would have driven the Renaissance humanists wild with envy and desire. You can read any book that has ever been written. You have access to scientific laboratories that are the most advanced in the world. You can pursue languages, literature, and history. Everything is available. Far from discriminating against minorities and females in hiring, every faculty search here is one desperate effort 
at finding remotely qualified underrepresented minority and female candidates who have not already been scooped up by better endowed schools. Far from discriminating against underrepresented minorities in admissions, we employ double standards in order to engineer so-called diversity. I can assure you that my faculty are not bigots. They have nothing but goodwill for history's oppressed groups and want all their students to succeed. At this very moment, millions of Asian students abroad are studying night and day for the privilege of experiencing this alleged maelstrom of hatred. If you feel so oppressed, step aside and let them take your place. But a college president never says any of these things, of course. Instead, he is silent before these outbreaks of narcissistic delusion, happy to sell out his faculty as alleged racists, and penitently promising to make further amends for so mistreating the oppressed students. It becomes imperative then for the rest of us to rebut the victimology narrative head on. It is not enough to call for freedom of expression. That is, if I may borrow a term, a relatively safe stance to take. Even some liberals will back you up. No, if we're going to restore sanity and civil harmony, we're going to have to take on the victimology, victimology narrative directly and assert that racism and oppression are not the predominant characteristics of American society today. For all our historical sins, and they were real and terrible, there has never been a more tolerant, opportunity-filled polity than our present one. The preservation of freedom requires knowledge of and gratitude for the extraordinary richness of Western civilization with its patient development of the rule of law, the scientific method, and the concept of individual rights. Until the majority of universities return to their proper mission of passing on such institution, Hillsdale and the Kirby Center will be ever more essential. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Are you aware of Harvard's even lawsuit against Harvard University for against being American? Sure. Uh, you know, this puts the left in a very difficult position. It's it's already always de already de facto been the case that. Asians don't really count as students of color because it turns out the, the actual operational definition of students of color is students who are not academically competitive. Since Asians are whooping everybody else's ass out there, uh, they don't count as students of color. Nevertheless, you know, it's been traditional on the part of uh, the proponents of racial preferences to play it as a black-white issue and to play off of, of white guilt. But it's been the case for quite some time now that the real uh, victims of reverse discrimination and racial preferences are Asians because, again, uh, they outscore everybody. Uh, they outscore Jews. They outscore general wh whites in general. Uh, and so when schools are setting aside places so that they can improve their diversity profile with students that are, basically it's black and Hispanic, uh, it's always zero sum. I mean, they will try to persuade you that preferences are not zero sum. That's simply wrong. I mean, the, 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 the number of spots that are available in these selective schools are extremely finite. And so every student you admit with a standard deviation or two below the competitive norm uh, is taking a place away for somebody else. And it's Asians who are the most severely impacted by this. So uh, what's been going on for many years, I actually think, f f to my mind, the strongest criticism of racial preferences, which is really, don't use the term affirmative action, that still has sort of a halo of good intentions and do-gooderism. What we're really talking about here are simply preferences. Uh, 
the best argument against them, as far as I'm concerned, is not the traditional con uh, constitutional one, however valid that is. The, the constitutional argument just says this is unfair. It's unconstitutional for a government body or a government-funded college to make distinctions on the basis of race. It violates the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Uh, and, and that's how the Supreme Court jurisprudence about racial preferences has played out and continues to be played out. As far as I'm concerned, though, the, the, the stronger, more persuasive argument is that racial preferences do not do their alleged beneficiaries any good. There's a theory that has been most uh, empirically fleshed out by a UCLA law professor named Richard Sander called mismatch theory that holds that if you bring students into an academic environment for which they are not academically competitive, if their academic preparedness is much below that of their peers, they're going to struggle in their classes and they're not going to learn as much. Uh, and we see in law schools, uh, every, virtually every law school employs huge racial preferences and the black students in law school end up overwhelmingly, almost without exception, at the bottom half of their class and in the bottom decile of their class. It, blacks fail the bar, bar at magnitudes more times, five or six times a higher rate than whites because they haven't learned as much because they're in an environment that is pitched above their heads. Richard Sander has gotten as much data as he can get to try and, you, you want to show the outcome of students that are admitted with racial preferences and those few blacks who are not, who are actually competitive with their school, to trace their course in school and their bar passage rates. He and other proponents of the mismatch theory have had to fight tooth and nail to get data. Harvard as you may know, just at, has put up roadblock after roadblock to releasing its admissions data. Uh, it, it's finally, they finally got access to it, but with, they had to be dragged through several rounds of litigation. And Richard Sander has asked the California Bar Association uh, to provide anonymized data on it's students who have taken the bar, because it has a very complete data set that has students' college GPAs, their LSATs, their law school GPA, uh, and their bar uh, scores. And sadly, a California appellate court uh, just denied his request on a grounds that it uh, was not justified under California's public documents record uh, law, which is very, very tragic because the data that does exist is, has not been refuted in, in proving the, the mismatch effect, but the more data, the better. But these colleges are absolutely opaque. And, you know, if they were so confident that racial ben preferences would, were good for their recipients, they wouldn't mind sharing the data, but they keep it under complete lock and key. Yes. The um, shameful uh, capitulation of the faculty and administrations uh, to these uh, preposterous outcries and demands. Uh, do you think it's due to cowardice, or do you think it's that after 40 years of the whole neo Marxist Gramscian project shoved through the universities, that they basically bought into that narrative as well? I, th I think it's absolutely both. I, I think I think that they've. They believe it, and it's just, it's bizarre. But we know that human beings are capable of believing very strange things that their daily experience would seem to, um, to contradict. Because again, for college presidents to say, I'm sending all my faculty through implicit bias training at enormous time expense on the theory that they are discriminating against qualified females and underrepresented minorities in the hiring process is contradicted every single day on a college campus. You cannot go to a 
faculty search committee where that's all that they talk about. And I have asked college administrators, okay, um, and proponents of implicit bias theory, if this is so ubiquitous, give me just one name of a female faculty candidate or an underrepresented minority who was not given a job for which he or she was superior had superior qualifications for, or I'll make it easy on you, was simply overlooked in a job search because they weren't trying hard enough. They've ducked that question every time. So it's, it's just perverse. But they, I think you're absolutely right, they believe this. And um, because it makes them feel superior to red state America, that they think that they are the uh, places of, of succor and, and safety for these ever-growing victim groups who would otherwise be at absolute uh, risk of oppression out in the great unwashed masses, uh, you know, who voted for Trump. So it's a combination. But there's also cowardice. I mean, there's people who I think should know better, and um, they just, you know, there's nothing that's more lethal to somebody's career today than being called a racist, and they don't want to stand up to that. Yes. Yep. Since the situation on many college campuses is deteriorating during a time when tuition is skyrocketing, do you see the higher education bubble bursting where lots of people just won't go to college or seek out alternative forms of instruction instead of uh, four-year colleges and universities? It, it may start happening. Uh, and I know that Peter Thiel is thinking about alternatives. You know, there was the big hope for the MOOCs, the massive online, what's the O, second O, I don't know, something courses. Uh, that didn't really materialize, you know, that, and ironically, it turns out that the most challenged students are the ones who do least well in online learning. Everybody was sort of hoping that this would be a way to help the underrepresented minorities do it, but they, they need the hands-on. Um, but frankly, for status-obsessed post-baby boomer parents that purport to be so equity-minded and yet are the most fanatically, you know, social ladder climbing people in the world, they are extremely eager to credentialize their children with the mark of an Amherst or a Williams or a Stanford. And that's going to be a very hard thing to break, uh, to, to break that lock on credentializing. Um, and you know, there's a lot of conservative libertarian voices that are also saying don't go to college. I'm of mixed mind about that. Brian Kaplan, a, a economist at George Mason University, has written a book called, uh, is it not the end of education or does education matter something? And part of it I agree with. He says, you know, m too, far too many people are going to college, which is absolutely true. Uh, and he, he addresses the paradox that employers put such a high premium on a college degree. I mean, the numbers are sort of clear that you really do get a very big boost in earnings with a college degree. But his point is, but these students, they don't learn anything, so what the heck is an employer doing paying an extra 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 in salary? But the book is also laced through with utter contempt for learning for its own sake. And, and Kaplan has various disclaimers that he intends to do that, but he, he, it's, it's unmistakably there. And I'm not willing to go that far. I still, I still, to me, the pursuit of knowledge and the ability to study literature and art and music is, is the highest privilege one can have. And um, so I, I think we need to still try and reconstitute universities as places that pass on the inheritance of Western civilization. Yes. It'd be great to see, and I imagine it's got to be available because the professoriate staff is listed online, data on the, the trends on these things. Because if you're going towards equity, then you've got to be hiring uh, underrepresented minorities at a dramatic rate in order to in order to shift what mm -hmm. is already the institutional norm. So if men are white men are overrepresented, then in order to shift the other direction, you have to 
hire two or three times as many underrepresented minorities as you are men. Right. So do we have data on that? Well, no. The, um, I can tell you that in some science fields, like computer engineering and economics, there's a slight creeping up of women uh, minorities that blacks and Hispanics, because again, Asians, they, they're very competitive. Um, it, it may be improving a little bit, but really the problem is the pipeline, and this is what, it just drives me nuts. You know, you cannot talk about the composition of the faculty without seeing who's getting PhDs. Blacks have gotten been concentrated, black PhDs concentrated traditionally in education. In 2016, there were 16 PhDs granted to blacks in computer engineering. That's 1% of the total. So to expect that every computer engineering department in the country is going to have, what, 13% blacks, which is what their percentage of the US population is, is simply absurd. And there's many fields, physics, you know, uh, astrophysicists that have no black graduates. So it, they're just not available. Um, but your question, I mean, it seems to presuppose possibly that, well, there has been a problem or that there's some discrimination at work or you're just asking empirically, are they even available to be hired? They're not available to be hired. And um, I would also say it's, it doesn't matter. The only, thing, the only thing that matters is if you're the most qualified uh, person in your field. And if we have a lab that is exclusively females, that are all the best uh, nuclear engineers there are, that's great. Fine, let it be. But if they're also all Asian males because they're the best, who cares? The only thing that matters is what they are capable of producing. The New York Times just this week had a story about, oh, the, the K through 12 teaching uh, body is still largely white females. This means that black students can't learn. Oh, please. You know, I was lucky to be in college in the 70s before multiculturalism hit. Nobody thought to complain that I was reading Chaucer, Spencer, Milton, and Wordsworth. Thank God. This is before feminism hit. I got to read the greatest writers without anybody whining about what was between their legs. And it didn't matter to me that the professors who I revered were males. The idea that you can't learn from somebody who's different from you is ridiculous. Um, but that's you know the idea, and so now you have UCLA requiring every faculty applicant to make a statement about his contributions to equity, diversity, and inclusion. So you have to ideally say that I'm researching the problems of underrepresented minorities, or I have the ability to attract and mentor uh, females in underrepresented minorities, which is basically code in California because you can't use explicit racial preferences anymore to I am a female or minority. But, you know, I, you have to wonder whether Albert Einstein could be hired at UCLA to, tomorrow because he's not working on equity, diversity, and inclusion. He's working on the theory of general relativity, and I submit that that's more important. Yes? Uh, have you, among trade schools, have you, among trade schools, have you seen this, this leftist, you know, idea of, um, among grade schools, and if not, do you think that a, like a certificate or a degree from a trade school makes makes that more valuable because they don't have this idea? Is a trade school a community college or a for-profit college? What's a trade school? Community colleges are definitely getting hit by this. They're the last holdouts, but they're getting hit. Um, I was interviewed recently by the Chronicle of Higher Education about a community college in the San Diego area of Southern California, Miracosta, that has just gone bonkers for diversity. It's all completely ethnic studies, hiring, you know, they've, they've destroyed whatever 
traditional literature requirements they had so that Chicano students only need to read Chicano authors. Um, as far as trade schools, if we're talking about like a degree in auto mechanics, um, th that would really be something if that gets hit with gender and race. I don't know. And the for-profits, you know, they've been on the news recently with DeVos and the uh, various rules on accreditation. Um, I don't know about them, actually. That, that's an interesting question. They're, for one thing, I believe that they are all commuter school. I mean, is there any campuses there? I think campuses tend to uh, sort of let this insanity fester and stew. So maybe a, if it's all just like correspondence course or something, it wouldn't be quite as bad. Yes. Why do you think uh, basketball courts and football fields are exempt from diversity? And doesn't the, the fact that there are, you know, such 90% African American accentuate the stereotypes that they don't want? Yeah, because Americans think sports are important. <laughs> Academics, not so much. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing, um, but uh, I also think, you know, it's incredible that we are pushing females into combat units, introducing not only double standards in physical qualifications, but eros. The most destructive force in, in, in human existence is eros. It, it, it drives people insane. We're putting this into combat units. Um, but again, we will not force women onto the, end, onto the National Football League because football is important, war less so. Um, so, uh, you know, people are quite capable of holding two separate ideas and, and uh, they're willing to have meritocracy when it works in favor of the victim groups, just not when it, it uh, creates a bar that for now uh, does not lead to proportional representation. Yes. Has the Trump administration in the less than two years that it's been in office done anything to reverse the flow of funds uh, or are, have there been decisions from the Justice Department trying to push back against this stuff or are they just not touching it? They're proceeding with deliberate speed, I guess. Uh, they've been very good in some things as you may have followed. Uh, Betsy DeVos is, is uh, holding notice and comment on uh, the campus rape due process problems. Um, they are, they joined the, or had a statement of interest in the Harvard lawsuit. So they have signaled that they are not going to, they withdrew a bunch of Obama era guidances to colleges that basically laid out the path for racial preferences. Uh, what they really need to do, and this would take a lot, somebody that really knows the regs, the Code of Federal Regulations, is get rid of in, in its entirety the disparate impact concept wherever it exists. This is the idea that facially neutral standards are nevertheless deemed discriminatory if they have a disparate impact. So if you have a requirement that um, firefighters know how to read at a 12th grade level, if that requirement, which is facially neutral, has the effect of disqualifying blacks at a higher rate than whites, even though the intention of the 12th grade reading rule was not to exclude blacks, it was to have people who know how to read uh, chemist, you know, the, the, the chemicals that they're using, uh, that that's nevertheless going to be deemed a discriminatory violation. So this disparate impact idea is really at the core of a lot of madness, and that's, that's what Trump should get on. But he should also, I mean, it's really, the National Science Foundation is completely out of control. It's just, it's unbelievable what they're doing. I cannot tell you the nonsense that they're funding. They're funding gender studies uh, professors to study intersectionality in the STEM fields. It's madness. So, uh, you know, NSF is a congressional creation. Whether 
then that means that only Congress could uh, rein it in. I'm not sure. But there certainly is a lot that can be done and that remains to be done. Jeff Sessions, obviously, I mean, he's a hero. And uh, I'm just going to say, this is totally unrelated, I think Trump's treatment of him is abysmal and grotesque and appalling. Uh, he has done so much in the area of law enforcement and uh, immigration enforcement, uh, but you know it's a lot to also turn turn to the uh, Justice Department. That's also for Betsy DeVos to do. Yes. Colleges like Grove City and Oklahoma Wesleyan for standing fast. But the question is, this looks like a systemic change. How do you go against a systemic change and, and pull it back? This is so deep. I know. Um, I know. You go like, you know, I agree with you, and I, probably the whole class here. I mean, the, I mean, the audience is is right right with you. And what do we do? I'm not in, I'm not in a university setting. Um, so I have no, I have no influence there. It's, it's, I have to say, I mean, I know that as a speaker, there's sort of a mandate to be optimistic and think we're going to win. Uh, I, I'm, I'm by constitution a, a pessimist, so everything needs to be taken with a grain of salt. But I mean, people like me, conservatives, have been writing about the universities for the past 30 years using all of our rhetorical guns to mock them, and it, it does get worse and worse. Um, I would just say, again, it, the more voices that can be brought to bear to push back on this idea of endemic racism and sexism, that's really what the problem is. The free speech problem that gets a lot of attention is an epiphenomenon of the victimology. As long as the victimology is in place, you're going to have the demands to silence speech on campus that is deemed hate speech, because it is viewed as literally an existential threat to these poor female and minority students. So, you know, people like me or, or Sessions, or anybody can invoke John Stuart Mill till we're blue in the face and talk about the need for open debate. It's not going to make a damn bit of difference as long as the ideology of victimhood is, is the dominant one. So all I can say is if it comes up in conversation, people just have to start fighting back and say, we are not a racist society. You know, I don't know a single mainstream institution that is not tying itself into knots to be fair and to hire females and minorities. The other thing, obviously, is that uh, alumni need to stop giving money to their colleges. They're, they're fueling the beast. Uh, these endowments are huge, and uh, you know, sh it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful instinct of, of giving back and generosity, but you have to do your due diligence. You wouldn't buy a stock without doing due diligence. Don't send money into these colleges unless you're really confident that it's not going into the victimology machine. It could be considered, do you think it could be considered deeper than victimology? Maybe a movement, a socialistic movement, perhaps? Um, somebody, Jordan Peterson sent around a video that the, some Democratic committee has made about their sort of message for America. And it's, very much class politics, not identity politics. And, you know, it's the, all of a sudden the rich took over and they're gaming the system. And ironically, there's a lot similar with Steve Bannon's message, which he, he made a film about the uh, 2008 um, financial meltdown. Frankly, at this point, and it may be because I was not really politically aware during the Cold War, I'd take class politics over identity politics any day. At least there, you know, you have people saying, I'm a worker. That's an accomplishment. Being female is not an accomplishment. I don't deserve credit for being female. It's not something to study. Uh, being a welder is. 
Being a chemist is. That's something you have accomplished. Um, so, yes, class politics is bad, and America, you know, the left wing of the Democratic Party certainly uh, likes to flirt with socialism. On the other hand, it likes its goodies, you know, and nobody's going to mess really with Silicon Valley. Uh, so it's, it's really sort of paying lip service to the hip notion of being sort of post-neo-Marxist, but I, I, I don't, I think the identity politics are a bigger poison in society. Um, so our immigration system was changed dramatically in 1970. Do you see a tie-in between that and kind of the diversity delusion today? Well, it could be. I mean, we certainly have a, um, a, a third world population here that was not assimilated, uh, that, you know, it arrived and, and got, we had already Chicano studies uh, that were breeding this separatism. So uh, I think it definitely makes it more difficult. You know, Robert Putnam wrote a groundbreaking work that said diversity actually lessens social cohesion in communities. It lessens social trust. He then had to walk that back because he got so attacked by the left because he's a liberal. Um, but it's, it's been borne out. Um, so I think, yeah, we have, um, we're now at the highest level of foreign born population since the turn of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century, but we're in a very different environment without the confidence in American values to demand assimilation uh, and instead, we promote separatism. So I think, yeah, it's it's. It, I think it's definitely related. I'd, I'd have to think about Europe. I mean, they're not. They're still much more committed. They're much l less apologetic about Western civilization than we are. They obviously have their Muslim problem, but French schools. You learn French literature, and as far as I know, there's not a whole lot of apologizing going on for it. What? Germany? Yeah, there's still, possibly. I mean, the opera's been destroyed, that's for sure. I mean, the opera productions there are just utterly tr atrocious. They uh, trash the greatest works of, of, on the musical stage. I don't know about the literature, though. Um, you think that, that they're not reading Heine and Kleist and Goethe? I, I don't know. Could be. I mean, German departments, ironically, actually, in the United States, the German departments traditionally were the holdouts against French theory, against deconstruction and Jacques Derrida in the 70s. At Yale, the Yale French, the German department was seen as like so backward because it was still reading books instead of reading theory. So whether that reflects something true in Germany, I don't know. But yes, they have a lot of, they are easily manipulated. They've got their own guilt source. So that's true. Everyone, please join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you.